Eleanor Roosevelt would speak at the opening class she always had. It, so it was, it was great anyway. But I'll start in here, I'll start at the beginning and I have some really entertaining stories to tell you. There's a lot more stories in, in the book. So uh, she raised me, half raised me. I was with her all the time and I was fortunate to know her because when I was a young woman, I would say, I'm gonna make a great old lady because I'm already eccentric. So <laughs> I was, you know, I'd watched her and I, I didn't mind getting older. I, you know, like a lot of my friends did, I had her as a guide and her last speech she made with Gloria Steinem and Marlo Thomas in Hollywood at age 94 and took me along. So she's been a great, a great guide for me. You can go to the next slide. And um, this is the book on the left. And it, it, it took quite a while to find the name for the book. I wanted to call it Journey of a Suffragette, but no one liked that name. So, <laughs> so my husband, we're sitting around at lunch one day, and he's really funny, man. He goes, well, why don't you just call it From Cowgirl to Congress, you know? And that's how the name came about. And so we tried to bring her into the modern age by making the cover a little bit like Andy Warhol. And then we also made it purple because purple was the color of Alice Paul and the movement back then. So that's how that came about. And I, 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 I'm the archivist in the family. So about 40 years ago, I, um, I'm older than I look, they, <laughs> they sent me the archives, three huge file cabinets of all of her items. And I didn't really look in them then because I was busy writing books and raising a child and running our organic ranch. And so finally, about two years ago, I started looking into them and I found this memoir of hers, which I knew was there, but I, I really got into it. And I found 19 letters to her from Lady Astor, who had become her best friend in England. And I didn't realize that Lady Astor was a woman from Virginia, an American. And she was the first woman to sit in parliament where she sat for 28 years. So they became really good friends. And so I think I have the largest collection of letters from Lady Astor. And I thought I should put this in a book. So it, it started out as Dear Lady Astor. But then two months into the book, I realized that the 100th anniversary was coming. So it was serendipitous. And I changed the name and I made it all about Jessie and her being on the front lines during all of this. So next. So she was raised on a Colorado cattle ranch and under very tragic and dire and dangerous situations. I don't want to mention them all here, but her, her mother died when she was 10 and her, all the women died back then before they raised their children because life was really tough. They didn't have toilets or water or all the conveniences that we all take for granted. And right before her mother passed away, they had gone into Pueblo where the town right next to them and Susan B. Anthony was speaking from a wagon and Jesse looked up and said, I want to do that someday. I want to be just like her and help women. And that's what she ended up doing. And so that same week about her baby sister drowned in the irrigation ditch and three days later her mother died and so she had to be raised by another woman who ended up marrying her father but kind of went crazy later women did that on the prairie it was it was a hard life and she had a baby brother and later on they passed away and so but, but her childhood stories were my favorite when I was little because she would tell the stories of old three legs the cat who saved all the other kittens from another cat who died of a thresher and brought them all up to the barn and raised her kittens and their kittens and all the times my grandmother got into trouble I just loved all her stories as a toddler and on up and so she was raised by two women and ended up you can change the next. And this is her as a baby on the left. And then this is Jessie on the left here and then her little sister, Emily, and her younger brother, Fred. And they grew up on that farm together. And her mother, when her mother was alive, had read a book that we should only have two meals a day. So she didn't feed anyone dinner. And she had these ranch hands who were hungry. So Fred and Jessie would raid the local fields and grab food and bring it home to eat and to hand out to the ranch hands. Next. And so here's her mother. Her mother cut her hair short so she could do the work that was demanded of her on this ranch. Her mother had been educated and been a school teacher. 
her father was a Lutheran minister who founded most of the Lutheran churches that are still along the north of America today. And so she was highly educated and ended up on this ranch with nothing to do. And she got in the spring wagon when Colorado was the second state to give women the vote in the 1800s, believe it or not. And she went into a spring wagon to go out and talk to all the men to get them to vote for it. And so Wyoming got the vote first and then Colorado and 16 states, believe it or not, before we got the US vote in 1920. Next. That's her father on the left and Emily grew up to be a beautiful woman who married a very wealthy man who took her around the world three times for their honeymoon. And there's Jesse on her way to Smith College. A teacher saw how bright she was and got her into Smith College. And her father wanted her to stay home and take care of their ranch hands because the second mother and her son had also drowned in the ditch. And so she, the teacher said, you can't keep her here. She's so worn out from all the deaths in your family that she'll be dead in a year. So the teacher insisted he give her the money and send her to Smith College. Next. This is her high school class. And she always said the principal looked like Abraham Lincoln. You can see him up on the far left. Next. She worked, she went to Smith College and had a great time. And her first job after Smith College was being the secretary to the man who put Pulitzer School of Journalism together. So it was he and she put it together in 1911. And she got to learn all this great writing technique for newspaper articles that she used later. And she took shorthand at Smith College. All the other girls wanted to just get married. They weren't going to be... Uh, secretaries or anything so she was the only one so when she got out of college everyone was crazy to hire her because she had all those skills and so her second job was she worked for the minimum wage commission and she helped set the first minimum wage in america for women in boston they doubled it from four dollars you can see it right on here from four dollars a week to eight dollars a week if you can imagine and they tried to get the children out of the child labor at the same time next and so then they sent her down to washington dc to help make the minimum wage for the entire country because back then if boston did something the entire country would follow and do it also and she, when she got there she got right into the middle of the suffrage movement she met alice paul and carrie chapman cat and she was the first woman lobbyist at the capital the first official woman lobbyist because she was hired by the minimum wage commission and she has this funny story that she would always tell all her stories i've heard a hundred times so i can tell them not as good as she could but she was supposed to meet with one of the gruffest senators to get him on their side so they could win the vote and she was so afraid that she put on a spring dress and went into his office and the secretary wasn't there so she sailed into his office and he looked up and he said what are you doing here and she said uh, a senator i i've come to talk to you about the minimum wage commission law for women and he said how did you get in here and she said well the door was open so i i just came in and then he looked at her and he said he only believed women should be home doing work and having babies why aren't you home having babies and she said she had to think about this because it would weigh heavily on the decision for women getting the minimum wage well senator it's customary to have a husband before having babies and he said well why don't you get one all the good men are taken and he laughed and he said well then i'm going to have to help you so he listened to her and she told him all the particulars and then he looked at her again and said what do you do for recreation and she went canoeing all the time. This is her in her bathing suit, her stylish bathing suit. And they would go up the Potomac and they had a hideout, she and all a lot of the other politicians. And they would stay up there all weekend and canoe up the Potomac, very dangerous place sometimes. And he loved it. He, he, he started glowing and he spoke for 20 minutes about his childhood in Kentucky 
on the rivers fishing and swimming. And then afterwards he said, what do you want me to do and what's the date? So they set a date, he came and because no matter what he voted for, it always came through. They set the minimum wage for all women in America from $4 a week to $8 a week. And then he told her he would help her get all of her bills through. So that was how she was a great lobbyist, you know. And there was one more story I should tell while we're on this picture. This is actually a picture from 1914, I think, and the Capitol building. And so she single-handedly took down the meat packers. They were like Chicago gangsters. They would get people to send their cattle by train to Oklahoma or Kansas to their fields where they would slaughter the animals and then pass them out. And once the people got their cattle there, they would lower the price so people would lose their shirt. And that happened to her father. Her father was one of the first cattlemen in, in Colorado and he sent all his cattle by train to Oklahoma. When they got there, they lowered the price and he lost his shirt. The next year, all of his cattle wandered into quicksand and sank. So he became a realtor. So she went, she was going down the halls one day and she saw this meeting. And back then, if you can imagine, all the meetings were open. Anybody could go in and believe it or not, anybody could speak unless it was a closed meeting. Imagine doing that today. So she, she went in and sat there and she realized what was going on because of her father's experience. So she wrote an article in her perfect Columbia school pattern that she had learned there. And she went down to her friend who worked at the Christian Science Monitor, which was a big paper back then, because she knew none of the other papers would run the article because they all had big ads paid for by the meat packers. And so she gave the article to her friend who saw what it was and understood and published it. And every day she'd go back into the meeting, it lasted for like a month, and she would write the article, come back, and get it published in the Christian Science Monitor. Well, once it was published in one newspaper, any newspaper could take a hold of it. And they all published her articles, and no one knew who was writing them. And P President Wilson had to pay attention. He made a law in Congress and stopped them cold for a while. They've always been at it. But he, because of, because of Jesse, she stopped the beat packers single-handedly. And if they had known, I think her life would have been in danger. Next. So she met Alice Paul and Alice Paul had a house across the street from the White House. And she would serve lunch cafeteria style to all the women working for her. And she met Jesse and invited her. So Jesse would have lunch there almost every day. And they worked hard to get Jesse to join them, but she couldn't because she was a parliamentarian, not a militant. And Alice Paul was amazing. I would have thought she was the hippie of the age, but she was a Quaker from a very wealthy family. And she had gone to the London School of Economics to get her PhD, where she met Emmeline Pankhurst and learned the militant form of suffrage, which she brought back to DC and started a group. And so she was an amazing woman, but she was young. She and Jesse were the same age. Carrie Chapman Catt, who Jesse met next and actually worked with because Carrie was a parliamentarian, had already been working on suffrage for 30 years. She doesn't always get the credit she deserves. She was the young woman with Susan B. Anthony. And when Susan B. Anthony retired, she handed the baton to Carrie Chapman Catt. So, Jesse signed on to tour the West with Carrie Chapman Catt as the second speaker to get everyone to sign on for the ratification of each state. And they became very, very close. Next. Well, that's a picture of Alice Paul um, sewing a star on for every state ratified, which she showed all 36, the last state from her balcony. This is Carrie Chapman Catt. She's the one in the middle on, on the lower end. And those are her women that worked with her, some of them. They're, they were all older than Jessie. And, and she wrote a letter to Jessie here, which is very, very interesting, putting Jessie in charge when she had to go away for something. And I thought that was very, very interesting. I have three letters from Carrie Chapman Cat to Jessie. And it, 
I, it's just amazing to, to have in my hand. And, and Carrie Chapman Cat was interested because she had been married, her husband died, she married another man, and they had a deal. She could work on her suffrage six months a year, but she had to be with him six months a year. So that was kind of unique for those days. And Jessie even was unique for those days because she met her husband, Hugh, and he and she created the first co-ed housing in Washington, D.C., or maybe anywhere. It was unheard of and it wasn't thought of well. And they hired a cook, a maid, and a housekeeper and they had like 14 people living in it. They picked a beautiful big home because during World War II, there wasn't a lot of housing and everybody was lonely in their little apartment. And so they had this beautiful time of eating dinner and speaking politics and just having a great time together. And then going up to the hideaway at the Potomac and canoeing, they all canoed, they all hiked. They were very, very active. Next. So here's the great story of the last day when we, all of us, won the right to vote. And it's such a great story. And there's parts of it that no one knows, but it's in my book because Jesse knew. And the last part's a little sad, but Harry Byrne was a, a young senator from um, Tennessee. And suddenly we had 35 states ratified. We needed one more, we needed 36. And so the governor of Tennessee said, okay, I'll have a vote. He, he knew they'd all vote against it because it's the South, right? So he called the meeting and it went on for days and days. Everyone came down, the liquor coalition, the meat packers, the industrialists, and Carrie and all of her women. And they're treated very badly. As you can imagine, they were spit upon children called them names, their letters were opened because they were staying in a hotel all those days. So the final day, it came down to one last vote and Harry Byrne was expected to vote against ratification, but he voted for it. And all the men came up and thumped him on the back and said, no, no, you were not supposed to vote for that. You, you were supposed to vote against it. And he said, I had to vote for it. My mother wrote me a letter. <laughs> so cute. So here's the letter. Dear son, hurrah and vote for suffrage. Don't keep them in doubt. I noticed some of the speeches against. They were bitter. I have been watching to see how you stood, but have not noticed anything yet. Don't forget to be a good boy and help Mrs. Cat put the rat in ratification. Your mother. And so the Newspaper men got very, very excited and they wanted to talk to her, but they didn't have cars, so they had to rent cars. And they all went up to her little farm and she was coming out of the milk barn with two pails of milk. And she sat them down at her kitchen table and gave them something she had baked that morning and some milk. And they said, why did you write that letter to your son? And she said, well, the winters are cold and long up here in the mountains and we're always reading Shakespeare. And Shakespeare's always fun and with words. So I thought I could fun with some words. And that is how 17 million women won the right to vote. Next. So there's an actual article from the day. And there's a sad part of the story that no one knows, but the book, Jesse, is that Carrie and Alice had split a long time ago because. Carrie did not believe in militant form of suffrage because she had done it for too long. And Alice only believed in that and didn't believe in it. If anyone didn't believe in it, she didn't want to work with them. So they split. And their birthday was only four days apart. So they were really the same sign. And so she, um, so Jesse always said several, several times that if we wouldn't have had both of them, we might not have made it as soon. Because, you know, England didn't get the right to vote until 1928, believe this or not. Switzerland did not get the right to vote until 1971, which shocked me. I was listening to that on the radio. I had to pull my car over. But anyway, so the last, right, when they got the vote, Jessie was still in D.C. She was still lobbying just in case it didn't go through. And she telegraphed Carrie and said, Carrie, let's have a celebration. I can get a theater and I'll, I'll arrange the whole thing. So Jessie arranged the whole celebration at the Poli Theater. And the next day, Carrie was back in D.C. in her office, and Jesse went in and said, Carrie, 
or probably called her Mrs. Cat. I really think we should show that we're like the men. You know, the men would be in Congress and they'd fight all day and they like they're going to kill each other, but they go out and have dinner or drinks afterwards. And she said it would be wonderful if you could ask Alice or one of her women to speak at the rally tonight. And Carrie just shook her head. She was a very kind woman, a very soft-spoken woman, but a very great orator. And she said, Jesse, I can't. I, I just can't do it. And Jesse was very disappointed and thought she had missed a, a big opportunity. But it was a great celebration that night. And Alice and her women, there were a few of them seen in the back. But guess what happened? You will love this. They, instead of moping around and not doing anything, they met all night and they created the ERA that night because they weren't invited to the party. So sometimes good things come out of those things. Next. That's Hugh. She married him, probably one of the most handsome men in the world. Everybody, nobody could believe that she got him and they didn't, you know. And so that they would go on the Potomac all the time. And he, he ended up later on writing the, uh, not writing, uh, putting together the, Social Security Department for FDR when they come back from England. But he got a job in England and he said, and they thought they were just platonic friends. And he said, I can't live without you. Are you going to come with me? I guess. Well, should we get married? They were kind of like that. They weren't like real romantic people, but they wrote this huge article about them. Romance ends the war and the secret wedding of local lobbyists. And it's a really cute article about how they snuck off to New York and got married and someone discovered it, you know, so next. So then they go to England. Uh, for eight years, and he he writes a giant thousand-page book on the pros and cons of coal, as if it was like solar, you know, back then that's what it was. When they first got to England, they couldn't believe it was so cold that they almost wanted to go home. They went on the great Christmas ship, Aquitania, and when they got there, the air was so thick with yellow smoke that it covered their clothes, and they couldn't see people in front of them. They bumped into them. It was the coal. That's probably why he ended up writing, writing the book for the government. And then they finally got a household and she ended up liking having her own maid and cook because that's what you do in England. And she, in the first two summers, they thought, well, let's really delve into England. And they joined the Fabian School of Summers, the Fabian Summer School with George Bernard Shaw. And they went there and everybody made speeches all the time. So Jessie got to hone some of her speech making, which she hadn't made a lot of speeches yet. And Bernard hooked on to her because she had a really good speech about prohibition. And he, believe it or not, was a teetotaler. He didn't believe in drinking. He said, alcohol is just like murder. He wrote articles about that. And he, and he also was a vegetarian. And he was really ahead of his time in many, many ways. And he was eccentric as heck. And, and he was a very bad dancer, but he loved to dance all the time. And so they went to the Fabian Summer School and they had dances and exercise and speeches and dinners. And she sat with him a lot at the table. And he was very kind of cold, like, like, well, you won't last long here in England. Well, if you do, you won't want to go back to America. You know, he was, he was a very interesting, sharp, acidic kind of man. Anyway, so she spoke all over London with him. And then right near the, they had two children while they were there. And then near the end, a friend said, you've got to go be presented at the court of St. James. And she said, oh, I don't, not that interested in that kind of thing. And her friend talked her into it. And they were the only diplomats in his corps that were ever presented to the court of St. James, because then it stopped in 1928. It didn't happen anymore. And she has this great story about getting that beautiful dress. Everybody spent $2,000 on the dresses. Can you imagine? That's like 10000 now or something. And so her friend helped her find this dress for 40 dollars or 40 what do you call it in England 40 anyway it's in the book and and she saw that the queen loved lilies color lilies so instead of carrying regular flowers like everyone else she was the only one who came to court that day with calla lilies and he had to rent a tuxedo and she had to borrow the train from another woman they had to go get curtsy lessons and it was quite an affair walking in. One person threw up right in front of her into the tall top hat of one of the chamber, Lord Chamberlains or whoever they are. And, and she finally got up there and curtsied. And then Lady Astor was presenting her daughter the same day. And they had been attending balls with Lady Astor all through the time. And Lady Astor loved having them because they were American and she missed Americans badly. And the funniest story, though, is that 
okay, a few months after the court of St. James, they get invited to a, a garden party. Everyone has been presented, like 9,000 people. So she goes to the garden party and she's wa watching the queen walk around with the king and the princess and everybody's talking to him. And she goes, Hugh, everybody's talking to her. I, I want to talk to her. No, Jesse, don't, because she would always do embarrassing things. And he'd say, no, no, just leave it alone. It, it, it'll make me look bad at my job. She goes, you go to the back. They're not even going to know you're associated with me. So she went up to the Lord Chamberlain and said, do you think I could speak with the queen? And he said, yeah. I think you can. I must present you first. So when the queen came by, he presented her, and the queen said, oh, so you're from America. And she said, yes, and do you know that Americans are terribly interested in you, uh, in us, so she really called us, us, why are they in, in, interested in us? She was a very humble woman in, in many ways. She was German. And Jesse said, well, they're very interested in how you keep house. And the queen threw her head back and laughed so loudly that almost the whole crowd turned to look. And then she moved on. It was very short. And, and Hugh came up to her and said, well, what did you say to get that out of her? And Jesse said, well, I asked her about housekeeping. Well, what in the world did you ask her that for? And she said, well, I've been reading all these articles and she's German and she likes to really organize and, and closed down her own palaces and they're moving to Balmoral next week and she's closing down where they are now. So the funniest thing is that in two days, an article came out in the paper called The Queen as Housekeeper. So Jessie had influenced her. Next. They had Rosemary and they had Richard. And then when he ended up coming back to America, he was the head of the Department of Commerce for New England. And you're not going to believe this. What is the ERA? The gun, what's the gun thing called? Well, they had a thing called the gun um, that we don't like so much. Well, I don't know. Some people do. But anyway, they called it the same exact thing. And he was reconstructing the, everything in America to work better under FDR. Next. And oh, while they were in England, she became best friends with Lady Astor. And Lady Astor's best friend with George Bernard Shaw. And guess who else? Lawrence of Arabia. The other big collection of letters in the world are from Lawrence of Arabia and her to each other. And they were just good friends. And, and she loved Charlie Chaplin. And she was just an amazing woman. She spoke out for women, children, and laborers. She really was a great person and the men were not happy to see her when she first arrived in Parliament and that she shouldn't have been in Parliament but her husband was sitting in Parliament and he he was a very rich man that had to go into the House of Lords when his father died he had to take his father's place he said he said Nancy you you go in and just sit there I'll get out of the House of Lords and I'll be back well he couldn't get out of the House of Lords and she sat there for 28 years next So here's some of the letters from Lady Astor, and, and it's some of them are just so funny. Like she says, don't talk about blackberries. I have a hankering for blackberry jam. I, I think they have blackberries in England, but probably not like they do in Virginia. And I can't read them on this very, very much, but she talks about all sorts of things like, like when sometimes they would go to the balls and um, Winston Churchill would be there. And that's Cliveden. That's her her house. They were some of the fifth richest people in the world, but she had grown up very poor in Virginia. So I, I love those kind of stories. And, and sh there's a letter to her how some of the newspaper reporters were putting Winston Churchill in her set of the Cliveden set. And the Cliveden set were thought to be like, like, Hitler supporters, but they weren't. It was all misunderstood. Even the maids and butler wrote the book later and said, oh yeah, we had them hiding under the beds. Oh sure, you know, they were making fun of it because it just wasn't true. People just made up a lot of things, of course, back then like they do now. And Winston Churchill and she had a huge fight next with each other. They didn't appreciate each other at all. Next. And he, <laughs> supposedly, she said, if I were your wife, sir, I would poison your coffee. If I were your husband, I would drink it. 
<laughs> so they 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 fought constantly. They respected each other though, because I found several pictures of them together next. So they went to London with like four trunks or two trunks. They came home with like 26 trunks and a whole house full of furniture. And it was really hard to find jobs then because it was right after World War I and everything was just really before, it was right before World War I, but the depression had just set in and it was really hard to find jobs. So he went from job to job to job, but he said, you know, I'm getting really good at a lot of things. This is better because then I won't ever be out of a job. And he always worked for the government. But then um, at a certain point, FDR put social security together and, and hired Hugh to come down from Boston to manage the whole thing and put it together. And all my life, I thought, well, I probably won't get social security. You know how we all talked about that when we were young. And I thought, isn't that ironic that my grandfather put it together? But now I do get it. <laughs> so that's a, a great thing. And then Jesse started speak, uh, public speaking class. She thought, you know, all those senator wives and all the women running these clubs, they all need to learn to speak. So she started speech classes, which ended up being very full. And she did, a, she wrote a book called Time Up and she toured the whole United States speaking in front of thousands of women and teaching big workshops and they'd all buy her book. And the person who, who published her book was from the Christian Science Monitor. So she had made a lot of friends in Christian science. She, she wasn't sure what religion to be. She had studied so many. And Hugh had been a great organist in Chicago for the huge um, church there. And his mother was a practitioner. But later in life, she went on to discover other means of religion. But she, she discovered and she liked to, she was a very curious person. Next. So here's an invitation. Of, uh, I have a lot of these that everybody's invited to the opening meeting of Mrs. Hugh Butler's winter course in practical platform speaking. And in the book, I have about 10 times that Jesse mentions being with Eleanor Roosevelt, and and then later on, Eleanor would let her bring her students into one of the rooms in the White House and conduct, have the kids practice, or and some of her students. She taught at a Catholic school, and she taught the women, and they would all get to come into the the classroom, and I mean the the White House room, and practice their speeches. And later on, the next president's wife did it. Was it Coolidge, Mrs. Coolidge? So, so Jesse somehow just always ended up on the front line and everybody wanted to do things for her. I think probably she's a little pushy too, but, but, she, but she wasn't afraid to ask, which I think, you know, I've always taught my daughters, don't be afraid to ask for anything. Next. I have a lot more pictures that aren't in here. There's 94 pictures in the book. Okay. And when she was in her early 90s or late 80s, sure in a gluck, she wrote the foreword for my book, From Cowgirl to Congress. She came and interviewed these five women and Jesse was really featured well they're all featured in it and she loved interviewing Jesse and I was there while she was being interviewed and while she was being interviewed Jesse was invited to speak one of the many times with Gloria Steinem and Marla Thomas so Sherna and I went along for one of those speeches and it was to get a celebration for the ERA which was, had made some big new move and it's a great book. You, you would like this book too. You can buy it on Amazon. And it was done, I think it was like 1974, 1972. And, and Sherna and I are still in touch and she's 85 now. So next. This is Jessie as an older woman. She wore hats. If you look at the pictures of the suffragettes, they all wore hats. And they were all dressed up. So it wasn't like it was, it was, it was interesting. It was probably a mix of people. There's Jessie. She has a wig on. She had black hair till she died. She never dyed her hair. And that's Sherna as a young woman interviewing her. And then I had the presence of mind to go and interview Jessie for two straight weeks, two hours a day when I was 18. I don't know how. So I have these tapes of her that I might add to the book someday. Next. And then uh, this is a picture of her and Gloria at a garden party that was a celebration uh, and, a, and a fundraiser, and that was one of her last speeches at age 94. 
And and it's funny because Sharna was writing the 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 forward for this book. She goes, "You're not going to believe it, Mila. I moved into the apartment building right behind the house that had that party, <laughs> which was amazing." And and Gloria and and Marla loved her. And Jane Fonda showed up at this one. I ended up working for Jane Fonda later, but. But Gloria and Marlo were the ones she always spoke with. I went to two or three of those speeches with her. I was in college at Chico State at that point. Okay, next. And there's my book. It's just so wonderful. Next. And this is a picture in a paper of Hugh and Jesse picketing <laughs> in their 80s. And he's holding her purse while she holds the picket sign. So I, I just thought it was a nice picture to end on. And now if you have any questions or anything, um, that would be great. Or if you want to hear any more stories. What were they picketing? Oh, it says there, um, if you go back to it. Oh wait, I have it right here. They were, I probably read it better here. Oh, they were picketing um, in Laverne, where she lived near Pomona. They picket, Representative Wiggins' office in El Monte on Thursday. You know, here's an interesting thing. She has all these letters to her father, and I put one in, and she said, don't worry, father, I'll always be a Republican. I won't be a Democrat. And as soon as she worked with Eleanor, she became a Democrat immediately, you know? And the interesting thing is you, you have to remember that the Democrats and Republicans were quite different back then because the Ku Klux Klan at one point were Democrats. So anyway, she became a Democrat, a lifelong Democrat after that. Well, else have any questions? Um, I I would just like to comment to say thank you. Very very interesting, and I've read always about all these ladies, and it's intriguing to hear it from someone who basically heard it from, you know, the person themselves involved in the history making. So thank you for sharing all this uh, wonderful information. You're welcome. I, I love history. I'm such a historian and I spent hours researching every single part of this book. I put footnotes in so you would know who each famous person was too. And I, I just, I'm crazy about history. I'm, I, I'm writing, I have a novel just finished about England and one of the herbalists that saves them from the plague, but it's about Catherine of Aragon and how she gets saved. Her husband dies and she is saved from the plague. So I do it with this herbalist. <laughs> no one knows how she survived, you know. I sort of, I can identify with it because I'm from South America and my grandmother came from India during uh, hostile times and uh, was an indentured uh, slave. And, uh, and so I know what it's like to sit at, at her feet and listen to stories. And to this day, I never take off her bracelets that I wear that she snuggled, smuggled in when they took her to work in the cane fields. So it's interesting when you look at your family history in that light. It's beautiful, thank you. You're welcome. I feel fortunate to, to have been with her. I wouldn't be who I am without her because a lot of my friends aren't, you know. <laughs> she just made me strong. And, oh, and she passed away. The Now Women, you know, National Organization of Women came to me and said, are you going to march in her place? And I was young and flippant. And I said, no, um, she already told me I'm emancipated by the work she did. I'm going to go live my life. But now I'm just like her. As soon as I had a child, I speak out against GMO and poisons because we're organic farmers and and the companies who are just thinking you need those poisons so I speak out adamantly I'm just like her and she probably would speak out against those same things at this point I believe <laughs> I love hearing about your grandmother I'd love to hear, oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> uh, no, I was going to ask if you could uh, tell us a little bit more about her Colorado days. Yes, um, it was very interesting, and uh, none of you are from Pueblo, right? Okay, because, you know, there were me too, me too moments, 
and that was in the book. I took some of those out because there's a whole family left in Colorado and the father was pillar of the community. And at this point in life, I say, if they're pillar of the community, still take them down because they'll do it to someone else. But he's long gone and I didn't want to destroy the family. So I, I didn't put those in. And there was actually some other things, some murder and stuff going on. <laughs> and so I took those out of the book. I may put the unabridged one out someday, but I wanted the family to read the book. You know what I'm saying? And I don't know them because every now we've gotten to know each other over the book. And, and so there was a lot of that, but she, she, she would always like get in trouble, she said, because like one day they, they were hungry at night because their mother wouldn't feed them. So they found this bucket of prunes <laughs> and they ate so much of the bucket of prunes that they were really sorry they did, she and her brother Fred. And they, they were sleeping on their beds on the porch and they had the bucket between them. And then another time she was, she was um, going, her father bought her a pony and a cart Oh, I gotta tell the story about that. Don't let me forget to tell the story about swimming with the girls. That's the best story almost in the book. But anyway, so she was on her way to church and she wanted to eat all this licorice that she had bought somewhere. And she wanted to eat it so no one could see it. So she was so into eating the book that she turned over the cart, cart and destroyed it. So she'd tell me these, those are my favorite stories as a kid, you know? But the best story of all was in the fourth grade, right before her mother passed away she invited the fourth grade all the girls out to her ranch and they had a big picnic and they went and swung on the rope in the barn and they rode the horse bareback and some of the girls stood up on it and it, was, it doesn't sound very safe to me and no, no parent was around because you know how it was back then you just kind of let the kids run and so then she took the the girls down for the best part of the day she thought to the the river and the river had a lot of quicksand and everything in it so you know she didn't realize it was so dangerous and when they got there she goes well let's just take our clothes off like the boys do why, if they can do it why can't we do it you know so she started peeling her clothes off without even looking at, and they all started slyly pulling everything up and pretty soon all the bushes were decorated with an array of petticoats and, and dresses and they all went swimming and they were just screaming and yelling and, and except for her cousin Edna who just waited with her feet and suddenly one girl felt shy and got up and got dressed and pretty soon they all did and then they all kind of disappeared and they didn't even say thank you to her mother and when she went to school on monday they were very cold to her from then on and and her, their mothers must have heard what happened and said well she's a very bad little girl and she said but you know even though it hurt that they treated me like that i couldn't help but think i had given them one of the best days of their life that they wouldn't they wouldn't forget and 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 she said that was my first foray into changing my sex to do things <laughs> so i i just love that story so thank you mila um i, I think we're in the so. interest of time we're kind of getting down to the last wire here